This is my 1967 Piper Cherokee 140. What's up everyone? So if you're new to the channel, my name is Dona. I'm a private pilot out of Montreal, Canada. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about my Piper Cherokee 140, what it does, what it can do, and why I think it compares to a Honda Civic. All right, so let's start with a quick little overview of what the Piper Cherokee actually is. Back in 1961, Piper designed this aircraft to be a direct competitor to the very popular Cessna 172. They wanted to create a cheap and easy to maintain training alternative, therefore they created the Piper Cherokee. Back in high school, a lot of my friends had Honda Civics and those were our first cars. So very similar to that, the Piper Cherokee was a lot of pilots' first aircraft to fly on the aircraft that they trained on. The Piper Cherokee is a all aluminum, four-seater general aviation aircraft. Now I say four-seater and we'll get into that later because there is a bit of a caveat on that statement. And it did come with two fuel tanks, one in each wing, each of them being 25 gallons for a total of 50 gallons of fuel. Now, if you wanna know how far that can take you, basically, depending on your cruise settings, you're looking at five to six hours of flight endurance so in real world distance, that's pretty much Montreal to Toronto round trip. The Cherokee 140 has a max gross weight of 2,150 pounds. And as for useful load, well, that really depends on what equipment you have inside your plane. But in my case, I have 860 pounds of useful load. Over the years, Piper released a lot of different models of the Piper Cherokee. In my case, it's the 140, which was the smallest engined option available when it was first released. In here, we're talking real cutting edge technology. We're talking about the Lycoming IO320 which is technology straight up from the 1930s. So we have a air-cooled carbureted 5.3 liter flat four producing, wait for it, wait for it, 150 horsepower at 2600 RPM. Now you're gonna say that is a lot of displacement for such little power and you would be right. Unless you were driving a 5.0 Mustang, then you kind of be used to that. But in this case, that's actually how airplane engines work. They don't rev as high as car engines, therefore they need to produce a lot of their power and a lot of their torque down low. You would think that this plane would be very, very fuel hungry and inefficient. However, when it comes to airplane engines, the 320 is actually considered one of the cheaper engines to run at just about 7.5 gallons an hour in cruise. Now over here, if you were wondering how we go about getting heat in the cabin in the winter, this is how that is done. Here we have the exhaust for the engine and it feeds into a sleeve here. This one is for the carburetor heat in case we get icing. And back here we have the cabin heat sleeve, which is basically a giant stainless steel cylinder in which the exhaust tube passes and then that heats up the air inside that canister and that's the air that goes into the cabin. That's how general aviation aircrafts create cabin heat. So in the winter, you can actually fly and be quite toasty inside. Now attached to this beautiful engine, we have a two bladed fixed pitch prop. This is the standard prop that comes with the Cherokees. And this model is actually a climb prop. So the pitch of it, and if you're wondering what the pitch is, basically if you look down this way, it's the angle at which the prop is mounted and the angle at which it hits the air. So there are models that have a variable pitch, which means that you can change this in flight. You can make it finer or coarser. And in this case, we have what is referred to as a climb prop. So when you're talking about a climb prop, it means that its pitch was more optimized to give you climbing performance as opposed to cruising speed. So this Cherokee will cruise at about 118 miles an hour. Whereas if you had a cruise prop on there, you could maybe eke out another five, five to six miles an hour in cruise. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're doing a very, very long flight, yes, those five, six miles an hour can reduce a lot of your flight time. But you know, since this is a time builder, it doesn't really matter how fast we get there as long as we get there. All right, now to get inside the plane on the Cherokee, like a lot of planes from that era, there is only one access door. That means that whatever you're bringing in and out of the plane has to make it out this one door. Some later Cherokee models did have a baggage door down here, but that was later added when they stretched out the fuselage from the older models in the 70s. And in order to get into the plane, you have to step on the little step right there and then step onto the wing and then slide yourself inside the flight deck, which to be honest, there is no 
real way to be graceful about it, you just kind of let yourself kind of come in and drop down on the seats. So compared to let's say the Cessna 172, it is a little harder uh, to get into these low wing aircrafts. So depending on your mobility and your age, well, it might not be the best option, but in my case, I'm still relatively young, so I can climb up and bend down to get into the flight deck. All right, so let's climb into the plane. Inside the aircraft, you'll notice that, yes, there are four seats. And we have back seats, but you'll notice that the leg room here isn't that great. So that's why I say they do say it's a four seater because it does have four seats. But unless you have really skinny legs, it's going to be a bit of a tight fit down here. It's perfect for kids, but for adults, I don't know. I wouldn't sit myself in the back seat. I'm a little too big and it would be <laughs> very cramped. The seats are removable in this model. So you can remove the cushions here and then you can just undo the bolt to remove the rest. That's an option that uh, came with the Cherokee. Back there we have what is called the hat shelf. Not so popular anymore, but back in the day in the 60s, I guess owning a nice hat was actually a cool thing. I don't know. I should maybe put some uh, trucker hats back there or something and just make a collection. That could look pretty dope, I guess. And then you have your storage compartment, which isn't accessible from outside. You just have to put your stuff. So we have uh, your storage back here. So we have, in this case, I have some headsets, booster packs and stuff like that. So that was your storage back there, just that white spot. It's not a lot of storage, but again, this is meant to be a smaller training aircraft. And then you have just lap seat belts for Everyone, this model didn't come with shoulder harnesses. So what we did is we added these uh, hooker harnesses. They hook up to the back seat seat belt, and then from there, you hook yourself up in the front. Should you have an accident, it'll help a little bit, but you know, who knows if that's actually gonna make a difference. So the interior of my aircraft is completely original as far as the upholstery and carpet that was never redone. So as you can see, it's actually pretty well kept for its year model. Carpets are nice. So in front we have both, I'm gonna call them the driver's seat and the passenger seat, but you can fly the plane from each side. So I guess they could both be pilot seats. Uh, but usually we fly from the left side, kind of like in a car. And in front of that, you'll find the yokes, which are, these are called the bow tie yokes. These were the original design from Piper for their plane yokes. And to be honest, I really like how they look. They got that real vintage look to them. Then you have the Piper Cherokee logo in the middle, all original again. And below the yokes, you'll find what's called the rudder pedals. They help control the rudder and also the direction of the nose wheel. Now, something interesting about the Cherokees of old is that they didn't come with brake pedals standard. If you wanted toe brakes, you had to add that as an option. If not, you were stuck with this thing right here, which is actually a handbrake but you could actually just use this to taxi the plane on the ground. But I prefer using tow brakes, so I'm really happy that this plane does have them. And right to the left of the tow brakes, you have the fuel selector valve. You see there indicating to the left tank, 25 gallons per tank, and that you have to switch mid-flight because this is a low wing aircraft, therefore there is a fuel pump and you have to switch between tanks as you fly around or else you will empty out one of the tanks and then run out of fuel, which is never really what you want to do. So between the seats, you will also find the flap handle. So this resembles a bit of a handbrake from a car, but is actually for the flaps. Unlike Cessnas, which tend to have electric flap, in this case, we have just a nice lever, just like in the bush planes, and you can literally just pull them up and you have the exact effect of the flaps right away. And the flaps are 10 degrees, 25 degrees and 40 degrees. Now in front of the pilot, you'll have what are called obviously the instruments. Now this plane originally came with all analog instruments such as these, but there has been upgrades done ever since. And now we have what I like to refer to as a bit of a hybrid setup. So we do still have some analog gauges. You have to climb, Right down here, we have our airspeed, we have our turn coordinator, we have our altitude, but we also have an Aspen E5 primary flight display, which actually has all this information in it. So you can fly the entire plane by just looking at this thing. However, since aviation is all about having redundancies and backups, 
you still have to keep these other instruments which can serve as backups should the main display fail next to that we have a mix of old school and new school so we have up top is our intercom so basically this is what allows everyone in the plane to hear each other there's a bunch of different plugs all over the plane for our headsets underneath it we have a new gps unit this is the garmin gnc 355 navcom now what's really cool about this unit is that it is a gps navigator as well as the radio but also when you are in the nav mode you can click on any airport and have access to the frequencies and then by just clicking you can you know switch the radio to the pro proper frequency for the airport you're coming in on and then this what's really great also is that it connects directly to your ipad which usually goes right there and i can send my flight plan directly from the ipad to the panel and vice versa super easily so i'm at home i plan my flight on my ipad i get in the plane press transfer boop pops in on the gps and then the gps tells the aspen what direction i should fly and then i just follow the line and everything talks to one another which is fantastic underneath that i have a backup comms again because redundancies and next to that i also have a nav comm so this one is kind of meant to tune into radio beacons and with the radio beacons you can get a direction to which to fly and that's what this little instrument right here is now in an ideal world when this head unit the gps the garmin works perfectly i never need to use this ever but again redundancies i guess that's the word for aviation when it comes to redundancies you need to have this in order to certify the plane to fly ifr so this plane is certified to fly ifr and it's pretty dope not that i have my ifr rating yet but i am working on it so underneath that we have this is our emergency location beacon so in case we crash this thing goes off it sends a radio signal so that uh, the search and rescue can find me a little bit easier then i have a cool little usb plug right here so i have usb c because you know 2023 and a normal usb 2.0 so this i use for charging my ipad beneath that we have the two main switches you use so here we have our throttle which is a push pull kind of like a lot of aircrafts some of the newer cherokees had levers over here so you would have like i guess kind of more like a a big commercial jet you know those levers you push forwards but in this case of the cherokee we have a push pull basic general aviation throttle knob and then next to that we have this is called the mixture so you pull that out to make it leaner you know you push it in to make it rich and this is also how we turn off the plane so when you want to turn off the plane you pull the mixture out cuts the fuel basically to the carburetor therefore cuts the combustion and the engine turns off and next to that we have the key for the magnetos which is just basically your ignition and then we have the start button so this thing is is pretty awesome it's from the uh, 60s and i have a push to start and the rest are just switches for the lights and other stuff like that and then you also have the all the electrical fuses are all here and this is all stuff so you can troubleshoot easily unlike in cars when it comes to aircrafts the fuses will always be accessible because you have to be able to troubleshoot if something's popping you need to know what's happening one last thing i forgot over here we have a bit of a I guess we'll call it a glove box. It's kind of a glove box. So in here we have barf bags and uh, we also have our uh, airport directory CFS booklet that's in there. And above that we have the transponder. So the transponder is essentially what communicates to air traffic control. And this thing sends out a signal with my identifier uh, for my aircraft. So they know uh, who is flying where and when. You don't always need to have one of these, but certain areas, especially around Montreal, they require that you have one of these so they can see you on the radar and they can know who you are. And then here we have our fuel gauges. So we don't necessarily fly by these. They're more as a reference. We tend to use the uh, time as a reference of how much fuel we have. But these, you know, they are, I'm gonna say 75% accurate. They do sell, you know, newer senders that can give you a more accurate reading on your fuel, but for now we just use time. Underneath that, we have the oil pressure, the fuel pressure, and the oil temp, just basic engine management stuff. Very basic. And over top, we have this is a requirement for every any kind of aircraft, and it is a magnetic compass. And if all else fails and you don't know where you are you can use the magnetic compass to kind of figure out what direction you're flying in so that is a very important thing all right now if that doesn't convince you that the piper cherokee is very similar to a honda civic especially the 90s ones i have one last argument for you and that one is modifications 
Now, I don't know anyone, especially from my teenage years, that owned a Honda Civic and then do some customizing work to their Civic. And it's a bit the same for the Piper Cherokee. Now, the Cherokee is a certified aircraft, and when you have a certified aircraft, there, that opens up a whole can of worms with what is available and legal to do. But unlike most Cessnas, the Cherokee already has tons of approved mods. Now we're talking about speed mods, if you wanna add a bit more speed. You can also do tons of engine mods. Now, this is a 140, it's the 150 horsepower IO20. So a few options I have, I can put an exhaust on it. So just like Honda Civic, I can go and put an exhaust, that's gonna get me about 10 extra horsepower. And if that's not enough, well, I can bolt on higher compression cylinders, and that's gonna give me another 10 horsepower. And then if that's still not enough, well, you can actually get the STC in order to put in the 180 horsepower into your 140. Yes, you can do it. Is it worth it? Well, that's for you to decide because you're not gaining the useful load that the 180 has, but you will gain the performance. So, you know, your mileage may vary and that's gonna be totally up to you guys to decide. But the point is, you can do tons of things to these things. Unlike most other certified aircrafts where you're kind of stuck with what you bought, this one has a lot of different options and I'm talking a lot more than just avionic stuff on the inside, which any plane can do. So for me, that's why I feel that the Piper Cherokee is just like a Honda Civic. They are both four-seaters, even though both of them have usable back seats. They're both relatively cheap to own, cheap to operate. They make great first planes, first cars, and the mods, and you know, when you add all those things up, to me, it's a no-brainer that if you're gonna compare this aircraft to any kind of car, it has to be the Honda Civic. So I hope you liked the video, and if you did, smash that like button, better yet, subscribe, and we'll catch you on the next one. Fly safe.